Attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the Essential Substance Abuse Skills webinar series. I am Kate Trans, and I will be administering today's webinar. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, or ATTC. The National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC is one of four national focus centers which serves the ATTC network. The ATTC network is a nationwide network made up of 10 regional centers, four national focus centers, and a network coordinating office. The map on this slide shows the states served by each of the regional ATTCs. To learn more about our center, the network, or your regional center, please visit our website. This series is designed to be a broad overview to assist in preparing for written alcohol and drug certification examinations, to enhance existing knowledge, and to improve overall competence and treatment outcomes. Please be aware that this series is not meant to stand alone, and previous education and training is necessary in order to pass alcohol and drug certification exams. We recommend that if you are preparing for an exam that you seek additional preparatory help and let this course be one of the many tools that you use to prepare. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled for Wednesday, September 18, where Bob Rarett will present on Professional Readiness, Attitudes, and Values. In addition to this webinar series, we offer another series titled the American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Webinar Series, which presents on current topics of interest in the behavioral health field. The next session in our American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Webinar Series will be held on September 4th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, where Dolores Bigfoot will present Dancing Along the Fringe, Managing Ethical Dilemmas and Clinical Issues with Tribal Communities. For more information on our webinar series, you can contact Karen Summers at the email address or phone number provided on this slide. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and we'd be happy to provide you with CEUs. The cost is $10 to do so. The CEU request form, along with a copy of the PowerPoint, will be sent to you within 24 hours of today's session. If you don't receive the email with handouts within two business days, please let us know. In addition to the PowerPoint handout and CEU request form, a consent form and information about participation in our GIPRA evaluation will be attached to the email you received following today's webinar. We ask that you fill out the consent form and return it by either email or fax. If you agree to complete our evaluation, you will receive a link inviting you to participate in a brief online customer survey. This survey asks about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. GIPRA stands for the Government Performance and Results Act, and SAMHSA asks us to evaluate our events in order to comply with this act and provide improved performance assessment and accountability. SAMHSA uses information collected by these surveys to determine how many people have attended our events, your satisfaction with our events, and how useful our events are to you. We hope you'll assist us in gathering this information about our services by participating in our evaluation. Before we start today's session, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the GoToWebinar system. To hide or expand your toolbar at any time, you can click the red arrow on the top right side of your window. To expand your screen, click the middle button on the top right hand corner. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Please use the question chat box to share your questions and comments. Your questions will only be visible to me, the webinar moderator. I will pass your questions along to the presenter at appropriate points in the presentation. For today's presentation, the presenter will be asking a few poll questions at various times throughout the presentation, and you will have an opportunity to respond by choosing from a multiple choice list. We appreciate your participation in these polls, as we anticipate that they will enhance the presentation. We would also like you to be aware that this webinar records participation participant attention time. If you minimize the webinar or are working in another window, the system will record your participation as inactive, which may be reflected in the number of CEUs received. 
Today's speaker is Kate Speck. Kate is currently a Senior Research Manager at the University of Nebraska Public Policy Center and has taught addiction counseling as well as psychology, addiction theory, and ethics, drawing from her background in prevention and intervention, addressing addiction in families, and working with pregnant and parenting women, and in training and education. Please join me in welcoming Kate Speck. Thank you so much, uh, uh, very much, Kate, for getting all that together for us, and um, welcome everyone. I hope that uh, this is going to be an, uh, a good series, of, a good part of the series for you on basic counseling skills. And uh, as uh, Kate was saying, that I work uh, in the University of Nebraska Public Policy Center at um, in Nebraska, so wherever you are in uh, in the United States, I, I welcome you. So today we are going to take a look at some basic counseling skills, and if you would just take a look at this slide here, these are the areas that we're going to cover. So basic counselor development, we'll be talking about that, uh, looking at the issue of micro counseling skills, counseling theory, self-disclosure and clear boundaries is what in terms of ethics and then we'll also take a look at a little bit at ethnic and cultural issues uh, uh, at the at the very end so uh, I'm going to just continue to move along in uh, our presentation and uh, Kate is going to actually uh, handle all of the uh, the uh, questions and the poll questions and the answers and all those kinds of things so getting started with uh, uh, counselor development uh, and talking about the different kinds of ways that we we develop as counselors, there's been a lot of information about that <clears throat> in the past. The one thing that we talk a lot about is global reasoning. You know, and what you know, basically what that entails is thinking uh, more broadly than just with ourselves and with a particular client. So what we're trying to do basically with uh, the global thinking issue is uh, put ourselves in a place where we're stepping back a bit and uh, trying to, not only are we trying to solve a, you know, uh, a problem uh, in terms of, you know, what, what's going on with reasoning, how do we reason through this, but we're also trying to question our answers as well. So it's, a, it's kind of an, a, a, an inductive process where we're evaluating our argument and re-arguing ourselves and, and looking at the, the issue of critical thinking in a global uh, perspective we're looking at the thought process as it jumps forward, back, and, and uh, uh, that's one way of thinking. Some people are very uh, much in tune to that. Other people uh, are more in tune to other things such as linear thinking. And this linear thinking uh, is kind of known, we talked about that as a step-by-step -step process. You might know this as the Socratic method, as Socrates, if you will. And the idea behind the linear thinking is, is that you have a starting point and an end point and that you're able to linearly see what's going on uh, in, a, in, a, in that step-by-step -step process. Um, there's, of course, a lot of difference between those two ways of thinking. And I think it's important for us to understand that neither one is right or wrong, but that we all have different ways of thinking about um, issues. And in the counseling field, we want to make sure that we are uh, addressing a lot of the a lot of our concerns or a lot of the things that we're doing with what we call critical thinking skills. So it's well worth your time and effort to kind of uh, slow yourself down and find out which way you think and how your thinking might impact the work that you do and how it might impact the clients that you have. Now the learning process is an, another part that we want to think about in terms of the developing counselor. And in the learning process, what we're looking at here is the different types of learner that you might be. So for instance, if you take a look at this chart, we have visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And interestingly enough, not everybody just fits just in each one of those boxes very neatly. Sometimes we have different uh, ways of fitting into those boxes. But this is a good way for us to kind of look at and see what are some of the things that we do as, as visual learners. Well, of course, we're, we're looking at uh, we need to see things. We need study time, uh, quiet time to do those kinds of things. We need to, to think before we move ahead. Uh, there's uh, other kinds of things in terms of, uh, you know, we like colors. Uh, we like, we, we understand charts and things like what I've got on the our PowerPoint right now. Uh, in terms of, um, you take a look at what we see the visual learner likes. Uh, those are kinds of things that 
if you understand yourself as a visual learner, those are some things that you would be drawn to. With the auditory learner then, uh, these are individuals who, again, are hearing. You, you hear them talk about sound. Uh, so the traits here for the auditory learner, uh, we like to learn sometimes out loud. Uh, we talk to ourselves. We might uh, read to ourselves. Uh, very much not afraid to talk up in class. Um, or you know, be open about that. This is a person who's awfully good at, at uh, words, awfully good at uh, remembering things. They notice a lot of uh, interesting things around them, and um, they enjoy. They're very good in study groups because they can, uh, they, again, they can verbalize things very well. So if you take a look at the auditory learners and their likes, there it shows you some of the things that are uh, specific to, uh, to that type of learning. Um, and uh, auditory learners are very good at write, also at writing responses to the learning that they have um, uh, that they have uh, uh, been through, as well as good at kind of oral exams. Now, a kinesthetic learner is a little bit different. Uh, they they learn through experiencing and doing things. These are folks that they have to look over um, everything and then experience it as and be part of the be part of the learning as an experience. Uh, these are folks again that you know they. They, they don't really care much about spelling and handwriting and things like that. They really like to work with the music on, and they're just they're kind of um, uh, learners that like adventures uh, and, and excitement along with their learning. Um, and they they also take their learning in in break in um, in in uh, steps as well. Uh, these are folks that uh, again uh, they they're model builders, if you will. So taking a look at what they like to do, if you look at the role playing. Uh, acting things out, studying with others, those are the kinds of things. Memory games are very good uh, for this, this particular learner. And um, I want you to think about this for, you know, in terms of what is your learning style. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a moment. Now our next um, area here, I want to talk a little bit about this global and uh, linear and visual uh, as well as uh, the, the auditory and kinesthetic. So we think about not only the learning in, in auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, we also think about it in the global and the linear, as I was explaining before. So if you think about these questions here, it's important for you to understand your own learning process as a, a developing professional. So how do you process information presented to you? Now that could be feedback from a supervisor, but it also could be information that the, clin the client gives you in a clinical setting. Um, who in your life do you believe processes information on the other end of the scale from you? So looking at how do other people process information, uh, and it's important to know that because again, those could that could potentially uh, decrease any conflict you might have with coworkers or even with your clients. Thinking about your, uh, your whole idea of adjusting your own communication when speaking with other people that process different than you. Important again, again, for the building communication and the kinds of things that we want to have uh, in terms of building a therapeutic relationship with our clients. So visual, auditory, kinesthetic, global versus linear. Think about that in a minute, and, and, and how do you learn best? And Kate's going to put up our first poll question, and that poll question is, um, number one, what type of learner are you? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, a mixture of two or any of the above, or maybe other. So Kate, will you take over for us now? Okay, so the so question the is up there, and so if everyone would take a minute and answer that, um, then we'll get the results up here in just a moment. And also, if you have um, other questions at this time for for our speaker, um, you can put those in the question chat box right now, and and as we take these poll questions each time, we'll also um, take some time if there are questions um, about the the presentation. Thank you, Kate. Of course. So you can kind of let me know when the larger percentage has come in. Yep, I will do that. We'll just take maybe another minute here and let people get their answers in. It looks like so far we've got about 67% in, so we'll see if anyone else wants to to put in their answer and gather up the results in just a minute. All 
Okay, so I'm going to close the poll now, and um, I will share the results here. You should come up on everyone's screen. You can see we've got uh, a good a good mix, looks like. A lot of visual learners at 22%, uh, auditory learners at 3%, kinesthetic learners at 6%, and then 69% believe that they are a mix of uh, one or more. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for taking that poll. We really appreciate that. And I, I, think, I, I think it's quite interesting that many of you have decided that you have a mixture of those kinds of, um, of learning styles. And it's really important for us to understand that, that, that we learn in many different ways. And so bravo for you for uh, your recognition of where you stand. And again, think about that as a, a potential uh, benefit to you as you process information and also as you put yourself in a position of um, being in a therapeutic relationship with, with your clients. So again, um, we've got this slide up here. Now I'm going to move to the um, developmental, or excuse me, the integrated developmental model. And this is a model here that uh, you'll see the picture here. This is uh, uh, Dr. Stolenberg, and he's the individual who's actually done a lot of work with, um, uh, with this particular model along with uh, his colleagues, McNeil and Delworth. This model's been around for a while, since 1988. And it, it, interestingly enough, it has developed quite a bit uh, since then. So basically what Stolenberg and et al. have, have decided uh, uh, in terms of the, the work that they did, and, and not just they didn't decide, but they looked at the data, actually. Uh, but what the data was saying is, is that counselors developed in a step-by-step -step approach. And that um, as we move through these uh, approaches, there's different kinds of things that need to happen for us in terms of our own uh, counselor development. And what this model allows for is us to be able to say, OK, wait a minute. We think that there needs to be some additional learning in a specific area. And so this model kind of uh, allows for that. It's a, it's a very flexible model, uh, which is one of the reasons that I like it quite a lot. Um, and so if you take a look here, the, the, we, we talk about the continuous growth of the individual. And we want to make sure that people understand that, like, like many of you have, uh, have looked at, you learn differently. You may learn one way or a couple of different ways, uh, and which, again, that's just who we are as individuals. And that uh, our growth is also kind of that way as well. We are very individual on that, and it could be that typically we talk about the sporadic growth, about you know things impact us and help us grow. And so the things that are uh, the list of things that you take a look at the bottom there are sometimes it's how much of a caseload we have and who, what kind of clients are on that caseload. Um, we might develop into a specialty area in our field because we, we work with specific people who have um, lots of trauma or chronic uh, ailments uh, or dual diagnosis or adolescence. And so our caseload might be something that really instructs us and helps us to become, you know, to have mastery in our work. Um, also our treatment setting, uh, who we're working with in terms of supervision, and, uh, and, our, and the, the other populations that we might serve as well. So you look at this integrated model here. This is the work that Stolenberg, McNeil, and Delworth did. And, and what they're looking at in this particular piece is the levels of counselor development. So you can see that we look at beginning, or you might call that novice, intermediate, as well as advanced. And then there's another area that is not here, um, and I'd like to add, and that would be the level of mastery. Uh, doesn't fit into the model here, but we have people who have who have mastery in, in our field as well. And so we can look at beginning, intermediate, advanced, as well as people who have mastery. Uh, looking at the overriding structures, you're seeing not only a self-awareness, but awareness of others. Your own particular motivation to learn new things or to stay up with the field. And then this whole idea of autonomy where you get to choose uh, the areas that you make your own development in. And then he has the eight growth areas. And if you take a look at those eight growth areas, that will give you a good idea of kinds of things that uh, we're looking for in terms of counselor development when it comes to what, you know, what do we, what do we want to see in our new counselors and our intermediate and advanced counselors. 
So if you look at the, the, the level one, uh, we hope that these counselors are full of trust and hope about the future. We definitely want people who are who are coming into the field who feel like they can make a difference, uh, really important. Uh, by the time we get to level two then, uh, some of that uh, piece of uh, that idealism we hope still stays with um, you as a, as a therapist, uh, that we also have you questioning yourself and questioning a lot of things and questioning theories. So that's that confusion stage where it's like, what did I do here? You know, what, what, you know, what do I, where do I belong, or what does this mean to me? Uh, we're also looking for um, a sense of uh, what your unique ability is starting to come out here. So you're not imitating your your professional colleagues. You're really uh, taking a step out and being yourself. Um, this also can lead sometimes, uh, you know, put us in a place where our attitudes are not real open or that we don't feel very sure of ourselves. Uh, the level three uh, development is I've made it kind of an attitude. It's uh, I'm, I'm able to understand why I did what I did, or what, I, what I'm doing, and how, you know, how this, what this means to me as an individual and what it means to my clients as well. So those, and then I would just say to you that the mastery level, I'll go back one, that the mastery level is it's, it's more than the calm after the storm. It's a very creative position to be in. Uh, you've mastered the information. You've mastered your feeling of competence. Uh, and you're, then you're beginning to create and look to other sources and bring in new things into what you're doing. Uh, and I think that mastery level is, it takes some time to get there, at least 10 years for sure. We know at least 10 years of practice. but. But uh, it certainly does, it does help, and that's where we get a lot of our creative ideas from. All right, so now the tasks and functions of super, supervisors. Uh, and it's important for us to understand this, I believe, because uh, that's part of what we are doing when we are uh, in, in the, uh, the therapeutic world, is that we're having a focus on the administrative for the things that we have to do for policies and procedures and the agency work that we are doing. Um, we have to have a, an evaluative component. So we're evaluating not only our clinical and our, you know, our clinical skills, but all the other kinds of things that go on with those policies, et cetera. Of course, the clinical piece is very important, the most important, obviously, but uh, this is where this whole, I, this whole work toward assisting uh, you know, clients, uh, we get a good story about ourselves as well. And so um, it, it tells us a lot about ourselves, and we have to review that with our, uh, with our clinical supervisor. Some of the things that you can do to help yourself in uh, this is to as assist your supervisor by letting them know what is your personal style. You know, we talked about that. What is your learning style? Are you a global thinker? Are you a linear thinker? Help your supervisor uh, to understand where you are coming from. Help them also to understand a little bit about how you would like to have feedback, uh, because they're likely to give you feedback if they're good supervisors, and we definitely want them to. We definitely want them to do that, and we want them to be able to do it in a way that's going to be acceptable for you as well. So I'm going to move on to the next area, which is called the micro counseling skills. Uh, and this is a, a pretty cute picture. It talks about you know, what matters most is how you see yourself. You may be a new person in, in the field. But again, we do have a lot of power and so forth. So um, micro counseling skills, uh, th there's a, a gentleman who's done a lot of work with this. And his name is Dr. Alan Ivey. Uh, he's uh, quite an a, a accomplished gentleman. And I might say that there are two books here that he's written that are very, very helpful uh, for the beginning clinician. And you know, I would have to just tell you that they're not just for the beginning clinician, that because they're for clinicians of all sorts. Uh, and it, he calls it intentional interviewing and counseling, facilitating development in a multicultural society. And that has is on a CD. It has a CD-ROM with it or with other exercises. And then he there's another one he's written called the Essentials of Counseling in a Multicultural World. And of course, that's something that we definitely want to always have um, a sense of is, is that. We're, we're working in a multicultural world. Uh, and so Ivy's work here is well worth you exploring. Uh, and it's very helpful also in relation to uh, your building uh, a therapeutic relationship with your clients. Now, into micro-counseling, what we're looking at with micro-counseling is those skills that you have as a therapist. 
what are you doing in the, the counseling relationship? How are you going about your craft? Uh, and so it's not much the aims and methods, if you will. It's more about, you know, uh, how do we improve our effectiveness um, as counselors by really looking at what we're doing and how we're doing it and studying that in some way. And uh, oftentimes that, that takes into uh, account you know, you know, going to workshops, et cetera. But uh, other, kinds of time, other types of learning might occur in the workplace. Uh, it might occur with your colleagues, uh, with your clients, and you know, with your supervisors as well. So one of the micro skills that we look at is attending. Attending uh, is an idea of you know, taking in what's going on in front of you, in, in front of you with a client. Uh, if you're in a group therapy, it's really kind of opening up yourself to that group, that group and attending to all of the people in that group. So we look at attending behavior as you know, encouraging the client to be involved um, and to do what we call active listening. Now, um, I just think if you would imagine yourself in a room with a window, think about this. You're watching you're from the outside. Think about watching other people who are having conversations without being able to hear them. You're not hearing what's going on. And so what you absolutely have to do is you have to, you have to make some kind of inference from what you're observing. And it's that observation that's a part of attending. So um, we, we don't really necessarily, we, we want to ask ourselves the question about, you know, what makes up attending behavior for you? How do you show the client and, and how do you demonstrate this attending behavior? Because it's very critical in terms of uh, getting the client to uh, have a level of trust with you. Another um, uh, element with micro skills is the open and closed questions. So open questions, of course, we look at those as uh, trying to open up the client. So those are things that are not um, yes or no answers, as closed questions can often be. Closed questions in our counseling field most often come in the assessment phase of the, um, the counseling interview uh, because we're assessing and asking a lot of questions about a person's lifestyle, their life, their, their situation. Um, we're, when we're doing that biopsychosocial assessment. However, uh, you can learn a lot, uh, a lot more with open questions as well. So we really want to uh, try to focus as much as we can to get the client to talk. And it's been shown uh, with data that the open-ended questions is um, pretty effective in being able to do that. Um, another observation skill we look at is reflective listening. Now we all have received information about this. Uh, so if you're taking a look, I asked you to think about looking through a window in which you couldn't hear the people talking. All you could do is watch their behavior. Uh, so we look at 85% of communication uh, is nonverbal. So what's going on in the person's demeanor, their face, rec their, their face um, uh, gestures, gestures with their hands, those kinds of things are important for us to really watch. Um, so, but we also look at the verbal behavior in terms of the key words that the client might be using. And what we're trying to do with, with this reflective listening is to kind of sort out with the client a bit about the discrepancies that they are, that they are discussing. Um, so what in any kind of contradictions or conflicts of ideas, uh, things that don't make sense, somebody saying one thing one day and the next day saying something completely different, and it's as if they've taken a, you know, something's happened in the night for a miracle because they've changed their ideas. So we call that incongruent uh, questionings or incongruent. So we have to use our reflective listening as a way to help us um, sort through the client, uh, client's thought process, if you will. Um, some additional kinds of things that, uh, that uh, reflective listening helps us with, and that is helping us encourage the client to talk more. Also encouraging them uh, by, by paraphrasing uh, some of the things that they are saying to help them continue to talk and feel comfortable, as well as summarizing uh, what we've heard. And um, it's important that you understand that when we're doing these kinds of behaviors, we're not presenting to the client the exact kinds of things they're saying. We're, we're doing it through an interpretation um, that we have. And it's that interpretation that we can feed back to the client um, and to see if 
we are right about that. And that's a reflective, um, uh, that, that's an area, area of reflective listening. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do reflections that work really well. One of them is to do reflect, uh, reflect a feeling. And that feeling is, is that what is, what's the feeling that the client is showing on their face even though they're not talking about feeling sad, does their face show sadness? would be an example of that. So what are the, the client's implied or actual uh, stated uh, feelings about something? And think about the, the way that you, know, you can pick up how a person feels just by their demeanor. It doesn't have to be verbal all of the time. Um, another way to reflect feelings is to reflect meaning or what we think the client is meaning. We're taking a guess in some sense um, about what the client is um, uh, having uh, for the thought process. So we might paraphrase some of the things they are saying and what we're trying to do is get to the part, part where we can hopefully help the client simplify, simplify a lot of this communication by reflecting what we think they mean and getting feedback from them uh, if we're correct in that assumption or not. And perfectly fine to make assumptions with these kinds of things um, because that's what we're really trying to do is trying to interview and get the client um, to the point of, um, you know, questioning themselves in some sense. So now we are actually going to go uh, and look at empathy. And this empathy piece um, has to do, of course, this is Counseling 101, really understanding. You might call this walk mile in my shoes kind of a, a situation. It's like, do I really understand what a person goes through um, uh, in their experience of life? And so what we're trying to do with empathic understanding is to um, help put a trust level down with our clients so that they feel more comfortable with us and are able to uh, share with us the kinds of things that would be helpful for them in the therapeutic process. So common problems with, uh, with, with empathy often are language uh, and other cultural differences uh, between clients and counselors that people don't often um, investigate or take a look at what might be important. So of those kinds of things that we're looking at, um, uh, open questions, reflective listening, empathic understanding, I'm going to ask you the next poll question. And that poll question is, number two, which of the micro skills has the most challenge for you? So I'm looking at attending behavior, open versus closed, reflective listening, or em empathy. So I'll ask Kate to take over there from now and uh, so she can do her magic. <laughs> All right, so the question is up again, and we'll give people about a minute or so to, to put in your answers, and then we will go over the results. And again, at this time, if you have any other questions about the presentation, you can type them into the question chat box right now. Okay, we'll take about 15 more seconds to get those answers in, and um, looks like we're getting just about 70% right now. A few more people want to get their votes in, and then we will close it here. All right. So I will go ahead and share the results. Looks like... Um, we have 20% at attending behavior, 48% in open versus closed questions, 23% in reflective listening, and 10% in empathy. Great. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you everyone for um, providing those, uh, that feedback for us in terms of, of, of the questions. Uh, we really appreciate you doing that. All right, um, and uh, again, it's I, and very important for us to kind of know those kinds of things because then we can talk to our clinical supervisor about the fact that here's where here's an area where I want to develop myself as a counselor, and you know that's a, just a genuine bonus for a supervisor when one of our one of our supervisees comes in and says, hey, this is some things I want to learn about, um, and it helps direct you. You know, it helps direct your learning. It helps direct, I think, part of your career as well, um, because when we think about being a counselor, I I look at this as a career for for people. 
So our next part that we're going to talk about is the counseling perspective, and this is probably going to be the longest part of our uh, presentation today. So it's kind of all the whole theoretical perspective that we're going to look at, and um, these are important. Uh, the theories are important because they give us some guidelines to go by. And uh, what are the things that we do know about theoretical perspective is that it's important uh, but it's not the end all and be all of how the cl a client gets gets well or how they uh, or how they do better in therapy. And so there's a lot of models out there, and we typically are going to take a look at the counseling perspectives uh, or theories that um, uh, again it's kind of counseling 101 kind of thing. So the first one we'll look at is a psychodynamic perspective. And in this perspective, this of course was um, uh, looking at the unconscious. And if you remember uh, in, your, in any previous information you've looked at, Sigmund Freud was at the bottom of this one. And uh, what he was looking at is this whole issue of transference. Now this can be kind of a confusing um, concept, this issue of transference, but basically it was, he. Freud has coined this word uh, because he wanted to have some way to uh, label or research, do some research around how patients actually transfer their feelings from important persons in their lives, like individuals that they didn't have a level of trust with or that they did, like a mother, a father, someone like that. Um, so important persons in their early lives to the therapist, uh, so they would transfer those feelings to the therapist. And so you all of a sudden become, uh, they become angry with you because they remind, you remind them of, their, uh, of their, someone in their past or their childhood uh, that, that may have bothered them or hurt them in some way. Um, now, we are typically don't utilize the psychoanalytic perspective because, of course, it is a, uh, a very much in-depth therapeutic model. And it takes uh, not only a lot of skill, but it also takes a good amount of training uh, for us to be able to um, provide um, uh, therapeutic uh, relationships around a, uh, the psychoanalytic perspective. Now, of course, you see Freud's picture here, and um, this is a fairly, you know, this is a, I think this is probably before he came, he went from Germany um, uh, and France over to the United States during the World War II, uh, but um, he, he, his issue in looking at um, why do, you know what's going on with people uh, and, and investigating them, he really believed that at the very bottom of of everything was that we had these personality um, structures, and in these personality structures, uh, uh, it, it it showed us or it helped us to be able to uh, develop. Um, as an individual. Uh, so uh, he also talked, a big part of what he, he taught and believed was that the unconscious um, memories, thoughts, ideas um, uh, were a big part of who we are. Those essentially came out in our dreams, if you will. Um, and uh, a big part of this unconscious business is, is that we don't realize it's going on and our dreams actually will free up the unconscious, if you will. Uh, he also was a big believer in the issue of anxiety uh, as a way of getting people moving, is that anxiety was a, a dynamic that, um, uh, again, got people off of the dime. Um, he talked about the development also at various stages of life um, and uh, uh, at some point later on in his theoretical develop, the development of his theory. So you'll see there the id, the ego, the superego, those are the three areas of personality structure that he talked about. The id is the person. This is your, your person, your adult, you know, your adult um, model, if you will. The ego is the one where you're like, um, I want to play with a big shiny knife. I'm three years old, but I still want to do it. So I want what I want when I want it. And superego is what we would aspire to be. He said that there's a lot of people who uh, get messed up because of they, they tried it so much to be, have their, their, their superego be what they are in their daily life. So superego is somewhat of an um, uh, aspirational kind of thing in Freud's work. Eric Erickson then came along. And uh, he was really looking at the developmental perspective of, 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 of human development in terms of 
Um, what happened in your early childhood? Now, that was very similar to what Freud believed, because Freud definitely believed that it, a lot of it, these things had to do with early childhood experiences and um, problems that, <clears throat> excuse me, problems that um, uh, youngsters experienced. And um, sorry about that. That should have been off. Apologize. I'm going to close something down here. I uh, better not because I'll close my window. Sorry about that. Got to get out of there. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, this perspective that Erickson had was, uh, again, this developmental perspective about the early childhood piece. But he also added into that what was happening in the person's social world. And he looked at crisis being a good thing, that it was a turning point, that it could open us up and help us to understand a bit about ourselves and the way we responded to crisis. And then he also looked at the ego, similar to Freud, but he looked at that in, uh, in, in the developmental stages, so that the ego does develop. And Freud actually didn't believe the ego developed too much um, other than his three stages. And Erickson brought in that new information and that new... Um, uh, perspective, if you will. Uh, also, uh, Eric Erickson really talked a lot about the personality stages. How, do our, how does our personality actually develop? And that was something that Freud hadn't really uh, spent too much time on. Now, Carl Jung, or Jung, Jung, uh, what do people call him? Jung was a contemporary of Freud and Erickson, obviously, but um, uh, uh, Freud and um, uh, Jung were very good friends. In fact, uh, Jung was his uh, protege, and he does he 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 began to think about this perspective of the psychosexual uh, personality, uh, and he didn't respond to it as well, even though he thought that Freud was an amazing man and he learned a lot from him. Uh, and they ended up having a falling out because. Jung said, I think that there's more to it than this, and it doesn't always have to be that hypersexuality um, that, that um, controls a person's life and their early experiences. So he and Jung had a falling out, and Jung kind of went his own way, and Freud went his own way, and they, they never spoke to each other after that, uh, and they had been very, very close. So it's a loss for both of these men who were quite brilliant. Um, but, but Carl Jung actually looked at, of course, personality, additional development during the midlife. So in other words, his idea is, is that your personality, the psychoanalytic perspective, your personality continues to develop as you grow and uh, challenge yourself in, in lots of different ways. And he looked at the issue of change in a positive way uh, that for individuals and that uh, he studied many cultures uh, and this was this was highly unusual because of his interest in many other cultures and how other kinds of uh, of cultures developed. And he came up with kind of similar theories. He also there's a lot of work that he did with what we call archetypes, and uh, that's another I think fascinating part of the psychoanalytic perspective is the thinking about the archetypes and how the archetypes kind of uh, um, are are part of of the meaning of our personality in some sense. So uh, in terms of the overview of the psychoanalytic perspective then, um, this, the limitations here is, is that it really didn't look at ego strength as a change need. Um, and also it didn't take into consideration the biological predisposition that we know today um, is, exists. And also then there were um, a lot of uh, concerns because uh, there was a focus on uh, parenting, especially mothers uh, who uh, would be, again, seen as not, not being um, uh, parents that were providing positive, um, a positive structure or positive uh, envir environment for their children. The other thing about the psychoanalytic perspective is, is that it's pretty expensive. It's a lengthy process, and a person to go through that kind of has to... Um, uh, uh, it wouldn't fit in our today's managed care, so you have to have plenty of money, I guess I'd say to that on that. However, what it did provide for us were some wonderful things to begin looking at the, the uh, framework of our behavior. Boy, that's a really important kind of thing uh, that we looked at is, is the, what's, what's going on with our behavior. Um, take a look about how past experience might color our viewpoint of the current role that we have. 
um, look at transference. And uh, transference, uh, there's some wonderful writings out there in the world about uh, transference and countertransference. And in order to understand it, you really have to um, uh, uh, kind of sort through all of these things that um, the, the client may attribute to, to you. Uh, so they may be thinking about you as a parent or a, a kindly person uh, that, you know, uh, or they may be uh, taking a, a, a viewpoint of you can't do me any, you know, you can't do me anything right. Um, you're always going to be coming down on me because they had that experience in their life. And so um, this, this whole transference and countertransference piece, very, very tricky. Uh, again, but we really need to understand it, I believe, at, at any, any level of counseling. Um, however, uh, again, psychoanalytic uh, counseling is really a long-term and typically uh, with a PhD trained um, therapist. Um, uh, so uh, there was also this whole idea of the ego defenses. It really helped us understand about defense mechanisms and so forth. And it also gave us an understanding of what was happening for us in um, the, the role of early childhood. Now the Adlerian perspective, along comes Alfred Adler, and he was a peculiar kind of fellow. He, but he, but he was, um, uh, again, uh, these, these individuals who were studying theory, uh, he came up with another um, idea, and that was, let's, let's talk about these mistaken beliefs that we have in the world. And uh, you know why are we always you know why are we always kind of, kind of coming down on ourselves in our own heads kind of thing? And so he wanted to start um, his counseling relationship looking at the mistaken beliefs that a person has about themselves and about their world. So looking at um, uh, this whole idea of we make basic mistakes in our lives that family and and he was he studied families he studied uh, the influence of of uh, families on the client itself uh, and he talked about the the need for cooperation in therapy uh, uh, between the the uh, clinician and the client now in terms of the Adlerian perspective uh, you might say that um, uh, these are some uh, these are some of the limitations um, uh, he, he took a little bit from Freud um, uh, but uh, a lot of it he believed that, um, and then that's the childhood piece, a lot of it he actually believed that um, uh, these, the dynamics within the family and the early memories that children had uh, were about the only piece uh, that was important. And so that's a limitation there because it's like, okay, what happened to you as a child is going to color what's in your world. However, we know that there are a lot of people who function very differently uh, and very uh, and very well actually, um, uh, even even when they've had a pretty difficult uh, situation in their family as a as a youngster. Uh, now, what we did get from uh, that Ed Laring perspective then was the the action plan. So, writing an action plan is very helpful for folks. That he talked about the sociality of people and that uh, they they tend to be again looking for planful um, growth as well as seeking goals and making decisions. Um, also, I think one of the big uh, issues here is that not only did we see uh, Adler paying a lot of attention to children, but to culture as well, and that to understanding the very uniqueness of uh, individuals uh, in the world. Now we move on to, from the Adlerian perspective, we're moving on to the existential perspective, and there are a couple of theorists that are pretty famous in this area, and uh, Viktor Frankl. Uh, in fact, um, Viktor Frankl um, was uh, is quite a you know he's he's quite an, uh, an entertaining gentleman, and I guess I would say to you it would be a good idea to if you could find any of his work, or any of his uh, lectures on YouTube. Uh, he's quite a, a very um, interesting fellow. In fact, he came out of this positive perspective that he has this existential perspective of who am I, why am I here, kind of the essential question that teenagers ask themselves when they are doing that whole idea of, of autonomy. And uh, Victor was, a, uh, or Frankel, I, should, I, should, I don't know him by his first name, but he was a Nazi internment camp survivor. And he came up with a philosophy that was amazing uh, in terms of a very positive philosophy about we have the capability to change our world. 
basically is what his was. So he um, really talked about the uh, uh, the fact that I, no matter what my experiences are, I do not have to re I do not have to come out of the place of a victim. Uh, and then that was particular, of course, to the fact that he was in the internment camp. Um, uh, and then Rollo May was another one, and he really was a, 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 a individual who looked at again self awareness, you know, and but searching for the meaning, meaning, meaningfulness of life. You know, what's in it for me, kind of thing. Why am I here? What is, what is uh, my purpose on the world? So this existential perspective of theory is, is that they, you know they believe that people are acting out or people are having troubles because they are unable to solve this this level of existential angst is what is often stated. Uh, so there's a lot of angst or uncertainty or ambivalence, you might call it, around um, where am I at in terms of my counseling piece. Now, some of the existential perspective limitations have that, the, again, it's about the, it's, it's, it really isn't very systematic. Um, uh, and there are not a lot of data that, that are going to give us feedback on that. I don't know uh, particularly lately, but that there has not been in the last 10 years that I'm aware of um, in terms of that piece. Um, Again, the concepts are much less grounded, if you will. And uh, so this, with these abstract concepts, it's pretty hard to study it, and it's pretty hard to kind of come up with any kind of questioning that would help us study it. Um, and then, the, uh, again, we talk about the philosophy of self-determination. I am in charge of my life. I can determine where I am going. So that's a big part of the existential perspective. What we did learn from that, and we did learn from when, when we were developing those other kinds of things, sorry about that, is that the person is the central focus of what's happening uh, in, the, um, in the relationship. And so definitely the humanity that we see in the other person is really important, and also supporting them in terms of an issue of freedom. So freedom is uh, a very important part of the existential perspective. Now we see someone who's a lot of people are very uh, who are quite familiar with this uh, individual, and this is a, a picture of Carl Rogers. And this is actually not. Uh, not you know we talk about it as person-centered therapy or the person-centered perspective, but actually he was really about finding out who am I and uh, who are you basically, and so it is a little bit of a branch of the existential uh, uh, theoretical perspective. And what Carl Rogers was was out to um, help people understand was is that people are capable, and people can solve their own problems. And if you're a therapist in a situation where people are coming to you and asking for help, uh, that um, your responsibility uh, in, in doing that is to help them have their own self-directed growth and to support them in, in, in learning for themselves. And so um, in, in that, this particular model, we're really very, very focused on the client, but we're really not very focused, again, on doing something, something specifically uh, uh, with the client. Uh, and so there's, uh, it's, it's kind of like being with the client is the most important thing. Uh, even if you sit and say nothing, the, just being there uh, tells them that they have a partner, if you will, in, in what's happening in their life. Uh, and so again, focusing on the person themselves. And uh, his, his belief is, is that we, uh, human potential is within all of us and that, um, uh, that we need to strive for self-actualization uh, when it comes to uh, our, ch our our, um, our human growth. Now, in terms of the person-centered perspective here, um, uh, again, he, he, the limitations that we have here would be that uh, the supportive clinician is there, but where's the direction? So we need some direction and some challenging in the therapeutic process. That um, there were very limited strategies, uh, just, just attending behavior and reflecting behavior. So that was pretty much all there was with, with, his, um, with his therapeutic outlook in terms of, of strategies or techniques. Um, that um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on the, the therapist, uh, if you will, uh, for what's going on in a therapeutic relationship. And that, again, they have, um, we have a different potential for growth for everybody. Uh, everybody does that, even our, you know, with our clients. So what we learned about 
uh, uh, that helped us in the counseling world for the, from the personal center perspective was is that we were able to start to test some hypotheses. We were able to look at the concepts and, and start some research. And we were also hope, uh, finding out what was working in therapy and what is not. So personal center therapy really helped us to have some guidelines and foundations in research uh, that many of the other therapeutic models absolutely did not have. Um, and the other part uh, that as another contribution, you might say, is non-directive counseling. That was a big part of um, what, that is a big part of the person-centered perspective, if you will. Now, another perspective is the Gestalt perspective. And Gestalt perspective was based on the work of Fritz Perls. And uh, he was a, a very expansive man. Uh, he definitely was a multicultural man. He, he lived in Brazil for a lot of, uh, a lot of his um, uh, years. Uh, he, he was a guy who um, uh, actually um, believed that you have to accept personal responsibility to become a mature person. And that our job as therapists is not to worry about changing the client, but that we, uh, and it's very, very similar to the person-centered uh, uh, perspective, is that we have to help them experience their full range of feelings. And, and, and to not interpret, we, we, have, we have to be careful not to interpret what's going on with the client, to allow them to do their own interpretation. Uh, and this is very much a, 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 his, his existential or phenomenological approach. Phenomenological simply means the study of you, the study of one, the study of a certain specific kind of thing. Uh, and um, he believed in that particular uniqueness uh, that the client has to become self-aware in order to become fully mature and uh, fully functioning, in fact, as, as well. Now, what we kind of find out in terms of the Gestalt perspective is that um, we have some limitations with that as well. And uh, these limitations have to do with, uh, it, they really don't talk about cognition at all in that particular one. Uh, that we have to be careful that we're not utilizing this for people who have a lot of trauma. Uh, and uh, particular abuse histories, if you will. Uh, reason being is, is that that exploration can kind of come back and, and uh, uh, kind of crumble a client, especially when all, this, all of these memories come crumbling, uh, coming back. And that um, uh, there's a lot of techniques that are uh, associated with this particular perspective. And it can be seen as somewhat manipulative uh, in, in a way. However, the contributions that we got from, from Usalt is that, boy, it's time to take action. Uh, that we also pay attention to both verbals and nonverbals. What is a person doing? Uh, although we looked at attending behaviors before and some of the other perspectives, this particular one is that uh, this Gestalt perspective is really watching very closely uh, the body reactions and so forth um, of the of the client. That that we learned about how to provide feedback. You might call this compassionate confrontation, but to provide feedback in a way that was not um, harmful to the client or did not hurt the client uh, in terms of uh, its uh, lack of sensitivity. And then a perspective on what we call growth and enhancement. So how can we get the client to, to, to do those kinds of things? Uh, next in our mix um, for uh, uh, perspectives is the control or reality perspective. Now. This, is, uh, this perspective has gone through a lot of change. And um, in particular, William Glasser wrote a book many, many years ago. In fact, when I was a counselor 35 years ago, the first, first book I ever read as a counselor was his reality therapy book. Um, and it was the model at the time. I must say that it was, uh, it was quite uh, different. Uh, because it rejected the medical model. It said, wait a minute here, We're, we don't have to follow that medical model. And it actually looked at um, the, our, our, our function as, as a therapist as being a teacher, uh, or we modeled behavior. Uh, and so that was, very, uh, that, was, that was very helpful to folks. Um, and that if you didn't take personal responsibility for your own uh, behavior and your own the things that were happening in your life that you were not going to um, uh, be again be a functional human being or be a, 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 a happy human being is what I, I believe was what his work was um, and he looked at all behavior so the total behavior and he talked about 
belonging, power, freedom, and fun. Those are kinds of psychological needs were the basis of his, of his perspective. Now, Glasser's book on reality therapy kind of turned, oh, about 15 years later into another um, way of thinking that he had, and that was, um, he, he called it choice theory. So the choice of an individual to uh, make changes in their life, to f face up to certain kinds of things, uh, to um, address their, again, it's about, it was about personal responsibility. So now um, he is kind of in a position where he is saying, okay, so now I've changed all of that, and now we're looking at the issue of, uh, of um, uh, this, this control. Now, this might seem odd uh, in terms of, of, of this piece, but the control theory or the control part of this is about controlling your own life, controlling the kinds of things that you need to, to um, uh, you do to have a, a f more fulfilling life. And so he's, it's being called now, uh, it, was, it was choice theory for a while, and now it's being called control. This is, again, it's a perspective of, that Glasser, and he's, he's quite an engaging fellow, uh, very much a realist, and uh, we've used a lot of his work in the substance abuse field, I might add. So here are some things that might uh, tell you that in, in terms of his work, what are some of the limitations? So um, it really takes away a lot of from the what we would call the counseling process. Um, uh, we doesn't look at any transference or unconscious kinds of things. And then um, uh, we might we might get into the role of an expert, uh, if you will, uh, with with our clients. And so we kind of know that that hasn't that doesn't play out well um, in terms of well and for a lot of people. But we did learn from this model of therapy as well in that we can really focus brief on brief kinds of things and so very short-term focusing with behavior and that we also could, could start writing contracts with our clients uh, and that so we had a contract approach what here's what you'll do or not um, and that um, punishment and blaming uh, is there but we have to be we have to be very careful about that um, and that also he his belief is is that Psychosis is related to unfulfilled needs. So that was very heavy in his early work of reality therapy um, uh, long, long ago, 35 years ago. Now, Arnold Lazarus, uh, he comes to us and, and helps, helped us to learn about the behavioral perspective. So what he was looking at was uh, your, your, your behavior is a basis uh, for your functioning and that there are some specific goals that need to be um, addressed. Uh, in the therapy model, um, and so he used a lot of summarizing, reflecting, clarifying, open-ended questions um, to get into the answer. So he was kind of using inductive reasoning to get at what was the problem for his clients. So the other part of what he was to do, what brought to us was is that um, this collaborative partnership uh, that we have with the client. Um, and he, he looked at three major areas of development uh, in terms of the, um, the development process uh, of an individual. So this behavior perspective, of course, there are several other, you know, we use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But just the plain old behavior perspective, there was another guy that you might know about in, 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 his, uh, in his work and in uh, uh, beha uh, in behaviorism, and that was B.F. Skinner. So he did a lot of work with that. And um, uh, so we talk about, again, uh, the limitations here. Uh, there's there's a, not a focus on relationships. Um, it doesn't provide insight uh, in terms of insight with the client uh, themselves. Um, kind of like just treat the symptoms and then you're done. So rather than look at underlying causes. And then, again, it's about control and manipulation uh, about this because they, they do testing of models. Now the contributions, of course, are that um, we're a focus on cognition and people's reactions and systematic way of uh, producing some uh, therapeutic um, assistance as well as um, this whole idea of uh, uh, ethics um, and, and very important uh, to, for us as therapists to have that ethical accountability. Now, you see other folks here uh, are famous people uh, in the world of cognitive behavioral therapy. Albert Ellis, of course, um, he's uh, REBT. Aaron Beck, 
if you know about you know just uh, some of Beck's work with um, uh, depression and anxiety, and then of course Donald Meichenbaum. And these individuals were looking at the idea that uh, our co our thoughts have a lot to do with our attitudes, have a lot to do with our behavior. And so examining those kinds of things and really being very active in the therapy process to help the client get to the point of self-awareness. And that when we have psychological distress or anxiety or those kinds of things, it's a lot because we are thinking incorrectly. So this is where we got the idea of uh, thinking errors and how those thinking errors actually impact us as individuals. Um, you can also see that um, uh, these individual, this therapeutic model also takes into account that we really want the client to be in an action model. That we want them to be active in, in terms of their own therapeutic um, uh, grounding. So we look at the limitations here um, and it's very much, you know, what about the unfinished business that might keep coming back? Well, we have to address that. Um, that you don't have to actually have personal warmth, that no, it doesn't matter what your demeanor is uh, in relationship to um, your cognition, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, unconscious factors and ego defenses, not, not a, a consideration here, as well as this whole um, a confrontational kind of therapeutic uh, approach, which of course there are both advantages and disadvantages of that depending on the client. So what we did get from this one, though, was self-responsibility uh, in maintaining, you know, we have to take responsibility for the things that are not going well in our lives. And what are we doing to contribute to those kinds of things? And take a look at that and uh, get rid of those negative thoughts. Um, and we want the client to be able to be empowered in this particular model so that they can carry on uh, with what they're doing. Um, uh, now we have another perspective here, and this is the family systems uh, perspective. And this perspective was a lot of people uh, were actually a, a part of um, the development of all of this family systems theory. Uh, this is a particular uh, favorite of mine, uh, Murray Bowen. Uh, we talk about Virginia Satir, all these people here, uh, Chloe Madons, Jay Haley. Uh, these are all individuals who take a look at where you're at in your family, what are some of the unresolved issues here, and how uh, interactions between family members actually creates conflict. Um, and they looked at ways of trying to kind of sort this out, uh, so by family mapping and acting kinds of things and reframing uh, the, the family. And um, sometimes it's, you, know, you can't get a new family because you already come from one, but um, they, they taught people to really think about um, the way the family uh, getting a different family or, or restructuring their family in some way was more uh, positive. So you can see the limitations here is that sometimes because of the large system of the family, individuals kind of got lost in that. And there's not a lot of research uh, on this. As, as There has been more, but there still needs a lot more research on the whole idea of the effectiveness of the strategies. Um, but here we got from this that we stopped blaming the family, like we started to blame the family in one of the other earlier theories, and that we empower family members and try to understand the family as a system. That's been very important as well. Now there's an integrated perspective, and this integrated perspective um, is one in which um, you're actually creating um, um, a way of therapeutic practice that you like. Maybe you're going to put in some of each of those, a little bit of some, or a lot of others, uh, and uh, come up with a, um, a, ther a theoretical perspective that's integrative that means something to you in terms of the art of therapy. Now this is, of course, is something that is called theory development. And um, this is theory development. You have to pretty much get to the point of being a mastery level therapist. And also, you have to have some backing of people who can do research for you, because uh, otherwise you won't be able to uh, to um, uh, get the um, uh, the reap the data that actually tells us, you know, is this an effective uh, situation or not. Now, Kate's going to take over here for our next piece because we have poll question number three, and because I have so many theoretical perspectives here. I kind of want to find out which of the theories that you are most drawn to, and you definitely can put in more than one. 
Uh, but uh, she's broken that up into two questions with uh, psychoanalytic and uh, Adlerian existential person-centered and gestalt being on one, and then choice, behavior, cognitive behavioral, family systems, and integrated on the other. So take it away, Kate. All right, so we're launching the first half of this question. We were only able to allow five options for each question, so that's why we had to separate them. But um, we'll get through the first one, and then um, we will put up the second one, and then we'll go over the results of both after, after we finish. So um, we will give probably another 30 seconds or so for this first one, and then we will move on to the next one. And then again, if, if you have any questions for Kate at this time, um, please enter them into the question chat box right now, and we will um, have her take those. All right, if we get those last few votes in, then I'm going to uh, go ahead and close this one. All right, and we're going to put up the next one right away. So um, go ahead and put in your, your answers for the second one, and then we will go over the results. And I do apologize. I think Kate mentioned that you could choose more than one, although I think I, when I set up the questions, I only gave the option of choosing one. So, Sorry, um, Kate. <laughs> no, that's my fault. I apologize. It's all right. That's all right. I guess I, the question was, is which of the, you know, which, uh, which of the theories? So that's, I think, it's a singular answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll just give a few more seconds here to answer the second one, and then we will look at the results. All right, so here we have the results of the first half. We've got 6% uh, um, drawn to psychoanalytic, 17% to Adlerian, 9% to existential, 63% to person-centered, and 6% 6 to gestalt. And then we'll go over the second half. Um, we've got 6% at choice reality, 13% at behavior therapy, 50% at cognitive behavioral therapy, 6% on family systems, and 25% on integrated. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I think that I think it, uh, it, it, we, if we don't study these uh, theoretical perspectives, it, it leaves us, I think, uh, in a challenge because we really kind of need to know what our own theory of change is and how we go about that. Thank you, Kate. Of course. All right. So again, um, thank you very much, everyone, for answering those uh, and doing that. We appreciate that. And now we're going to talk a little bit about assessing readiness to change. And many of you may be very familiar with this concept. And this concept has to do with two fellows who did great research, uh, James Prochaska and Carlo Di Clementi. And basically, these folks were looking at the issue of uh, tobacco use. Uh, and uh, it has become a very uh, well-known uh, and widely used theoretical perspective on addressing the issue of other behavioral health change and understanding readiness to change and how important that is uh, for us to understand that. So this is the, the process of change through the stage of change. Of, of uh, This, again, was developed in 1993. It was very much uh, a part of a similar development toward of motivational interviewing. They were developing at the same time. And if you know, today we're not going to go over all of the stuff here, but I want to tell you that there is a lot of wonderful reading about this model and about how this model can be so helpful um, well, when it comes to uh, understanding a client's readiness and how they pro progress through change and helping them um, get to the point. So we look to to the point of change. So we look at 
um, the idea of uh, pre-contemplation of not considering change, uh, contemplation and both their feeling ambivalence, it's kind of the yeah but syndrome, uh, preparation, determination to change, uh, developing a plan, action where we have some change started, maintenance where we are seeing that change uh, roll out in the person's life, and then of course thinking about the fact that people of often backslide um, and, and, and if they do backslide, they may not come back in at pre-contemplation or contemplation. They might just get back on track with preparation, um, uh, depending on how long their relapse is. And so this is a nice model to think about in terms of assessing state, uh, the, where the client would be at in terms of their change, um, their change process, because then we can really detail our interventions uh, related to that. All right, so um, uh, we'll move on from there. And uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about self-disclosure and boundaries. And so this kind of moves us into a little bit of the ethics piece here. But uh, it's real important for us to have an understanding of self-disclosure. So how much is, should we reveal about ourselves when it comes to working with clients? And, you know, we, uh, we think about different kinds of, of, of self-disclosure. We think about, um, um, like, for instance, I uh, had a colleague who I'm not really friends with. But I, I like this person, and we, we happen to see each other quite a lot because we work together a lot on different projects, and she lost a family member. And uh, I, you know, I shared with her uh, that I, I was very sorry for her loss, and I also shared my own experience of losing a family member just to let her know that you know, I, I did understand, and she was pretty grateful for that. But in a situation like that, that's very different than when I'm working with a client. Um, I may or may not find that to be a therapeutic benefit. Uh, to sharing something like that. And so uh, we look at uh, this as a, something that needs to have very careful consideration and that we are going to work with our supervisors um, uh, to talk about those kinds of things. If you find yourself doing a lot of personal sharing or, uh, again, self-disclosing, it's something you want to look at about why are you doing that and to whose benefit uh, that is. Uh, and in some sense, it comes, it comes up with it as an ethical issue because if you're doing more of that than the the client is the client really getting what they need. So um, uh, I've got a little little couple of things I'll talk a, a bit about with self disclosure here. Um, so we look at some of the boundaries and uh, you know uh, keeping clear uh, clear boundaries. So making sure that we um, are uh, uh, you know thinking about this um, that it could in impact for sure the um, relationship that we have. And there's a study that was done by Steve Martino, and they looked at um, uh, a variety of different situations. And this was done in 2009. And what he did was he looked at 736 sessions. And he, looked, uh, he, he said that this informal chat, if you will, or self-disclosure was coming up in the, uh, the um, conversations about 40, 42% of the time. And he talked about once or twice per session. And he, he, he noted that 68% of counselors had informal discussions three or more times in at least one of their sessions. And that about 20% of the counselors actually initiated uh, this informal discussion uh, quite a bit of the time. So now we have our polling question number four. And Kate's going to take over here again. And I want to ask you, how helpful do you think informal conversations are in the therapeutic session? So go ahead and take over, Kate. All right. So that question is up. And again, we will allow for about a minute for people to answer that. And um, again, at this time and between now and the end, feel free to um, submit any questions that you have for Kate on this presentation into that chat box. And um, then, you know, we can, if we have time, we can go over some now or we'll, we'll go over them at the, the end of the presentation. So we'll just take another 15 seconds or so and um, get your final votes in for this question, and then we'll go over the results. All right. So it looks like 31% found it a little helpful, 53% found it moderately helpful, and 17% found it very helpful. Okay. 
You know, very good. And you know, that's exactly what Steve Martino found out too. Is is that uh, a little a little uh, chat? Uh, and again, I want to thank you all for um, uh, taking part in that. And uh, thank you, Kate, again um, uh, for doing that. Um, what Martino did find out was is that some of that informal chat, you know, is is pretty helpful uh, for clients to get comfortable and feel. Uh, as though they are relating to the individual that they're sitting with, uh, whether it's in group therapy or whether it's in individual sessions. Uh, but too much of it could be harmful. Too much. So if we're doing it a lot, you know, if we're doing it 75% of the time, we've got to be careful. Uh, so um, uh, he's, he's saying that, yes, informal chat can be helpful um, and can also, you know, have negative outcomes associated with it if we're, if we're not uh, monitoring that. So. All right, and then our last part here is going to be talking about cultural and ethnic issues. And uh, in this case, uh, we're looking at um, culture as a, a, a very important part of the change process. And when you're thinking about culture, what it is is really a person's worldview. Uh, it's about what they see the world is how they, what they we call operationalizing themselves in the world. So culture is very important whether, you know, and again, it's, it could be ethnicity, uh, it also could be um, uh, section of where you grew, where you grew up. Um, there's all kinds of things that make up culture, and so it's kind of everything, and it's all part of what we do as a um, society, if you will. So our culture is changing, you might say. And most recently on the news, we're talking about, especially in our state, we have a higher percentage of uh, Hispanics that is coming to our state, and that. Um, uh, how the, how that's happening and how we're integrating that and how we're paying attention uh, to to uh, the, the the new change that we have. But lots of times people don't pay attention to the old change that they have. You know, again, what is culture? Thinking about your own culture, being understanding of your culture versus somebody else's, especially that of course in the therapeutic relationship. So we take a look at how our culture is shaped. These are the things that all go into um, the, uh, why, what we believe, why we believe, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, another concept that we've had to really look at is this internalized ra racism, and that has a lot to do with the issue of people's migration uh, in, in the world, actually, not just uh, in North America, this is what this slide is showing, but definitely um, we see people who are of, of um, as, well, who have, uh, they call themselves Mexican or Chicano. Uh, that's very different than Hispanic um, or somebody who's Spanish, uh, coming, you know, coming from uh, uh, again from the the southern parts of, of uh, South America, like Chile, um, uh, or some of the other Spanish-speaking countries. And so there's a lot of different um, uh, models, if you will, about thinking thinking about culture, but I would just say it's really a, a very important part of what we do and a, an important part of our um, our realization of who we're serving as well. So we see a real difference in uh, what's happening in terms of culture and race, if you will, uh, in, in, in our U.S. Census really important for us to un kind of understand that uh, our world is changing. Oh, and I guess I did mention the Chicano. Um, again, this is that whole idea of I'm not Mexican, I'm not American, uh, but I want to be proud of my heritage and my history and all the things that make up who I am and who've made up my ancestors. And the, 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 um, uh, kind of the things that I follow, the things that I do in my life and how important that is for rituals and uh, how we celebrate the, our heritage, uh, again, as a way of identification in our world. So we have to identify ourselves with culture. And um, of course, we look at the Native American, the, His the Hispanic, the, what has changed in terms of uh, drug use and drug reports, in terms of um, the cultural outcome of that. Um, here we take a look at the different tribes uh, that uh, are in our country. Uh, this is an old map tribes of the Indian nation, but a very uh, important uh, map because it tells us, you know, where our Native American partners um, kind of landed after, after our, our culture actually um, tried to um, uh, de delimit their um, influence in the world. 
and they wanted, they wanted them very limited, and so they ended up on reservations and lands, and there was, there's just been a lot of uh, trauma uh, based on this. And I might say that um, I want to just, just say something about uh, this, this gentleman here. His name is Dwayne Mackey, and Dr. Mackey was a colleague of mine uh, and uh, a wonderful man, did a lot of work with the Native American in substance use. Uh, and has worked for the Prairie Lands ATTC, now the American Indian Alaska Native ATTC. And uh, he's created a curriculum, and that curriculum is now being used, um, especially in his memory, uh, of, of the kinds of things that he had to offer to the field, if you will, uh, for addressing um, the, the different nations of, of, uh, of American Indian. So here are the bands that you see the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota bands. There's a lot of them here. Um, and you see these in our, our Midwestern part of the country, actually. All right. And uh, so we have Santee, the Teton, and the Yankton bands. And then if you'll take a look at this particular um, piece, you take a look at the transfers from Native Americans to white. So if you, if you look at the majority of the country, of course, the largest majority of the country was actually uh, owned by the Indians until in, in 1775, and then just under 100 years later, here we have uh, our Native American uh, brothers and sisters who are living in a much smaller um, part, parts of the country because of the um, kind of American approach, I guess I would say. Um, so the American approach to working with Native Americans, which of course we now know uh, that uh, that is uh, been very harmful and trauma traumatizing to these in to, to the uh, individuals. All right, so you're looking at the different kinds of things that make up culture. Of course, Native American culture. You were seeing those kinds of things here. Um, we're also looking at African Americans. Uh, we look in at the higher number of folks uh, in this uh, racial category who are smoking tobacco, and also who are more at risk for other diseases because of their genetic makeup. Uh, for Asian Americans, we're also seeing a large number of those individuals who are taking up not only alcohol use, but tobacco use. And it's likely that we will see more of those individuals in our therapy groups. Um, and so what we want to try to do with culture is to um, be understanding uh, of how we approach health. Everybody does. Uh, try to be careful about interpretations and stereotyping, uh, making sure that we are uh, understanding diversity and being open to it, um, looking at the acculturation of an individual and asking the individual, not assuming, okay? and then understanding our own risks and biases here. Um, so this whole idea of cultural, uh, other, uh, additional cultural piece is that it's very different than, than the um, Europe, Western European um, cultural uh, understanding, and that is where you know, we have a shared meaning a collectivist versus individualist. You might say that the American culture is an individualist culture and, and uh, less collective. That is vertical versus horizontal. And we talk about active as, as well as passive. So really understanding those areas. Um, in terms of uh, tips for achieving multicultural competence, I really think that that's something that takes a lot of study. It's not something that you can actually get in a workshop you know, in a few minutes that I'm presenting that. Again, we're touching on a lot of issues here, but um, really important for us to study that uh, and uh, kind of understand where our therapeutic models are taking us when it comes to um, cultural considerations. So now we have uh, at the, this come to the point uh, close to the end of this, where I'm hoping that there might be some questions that we can t uh, get in, in if there are any from Kate. So here's a summary of what we've looked at in this particular workshop. Um, I'm hoping that um, we can get any discussion in there. And I think you are looking, Kate, to do some additional kinds of things here? Yeah, so um, at this point, um, we will take additional questions. Um, and you can type those into the question chat box on your webinar toolbar. Um, we've got one to start with, so I'll um, address this to you, Kate. The first question is, is it fair to assume a person is of a particular culture because of their race or ethnicity? 
Okay. Well, you use the term fairness, and uh, I, I guess uh, I guess it wouldn't I wouldn't it would not be a good thing to be able to make that assumption, in my opinion. Um, the issue the issue here is is that um, we have a culture different acculturation, uh, and uh, you might see a person who looks as if they are of one uh, of one ethnicity, but their cultural identity may be something very different, and that's so important because it's about the person's cultural identity and and how they see that. So what we want to do is we want to ask that person. We want to talk with that individual. Thank you for the question. And I don't see any other questions at this point, but if, um, if you have any final questions, please submit them now, and um, we will have, uh, give Kate just a quick chance to address those. And I want to thank everybody for their participation today. I know it's uh, difficult sometimes to be sitting at your computer listening uh, to somebody talk for an hour and a half. And uh, thank you for participating in the poll questions. I think that uh, I've helped give us some activity and then hopefully thinking about you know, your own um, practice and, and how you can improve your practice by questioning and reviewing. All right, I've got a couple more questions here. So the first one is, can a culture be considered someone's adapted behavior through addiction? Oh, now that's a very interesting, very interesting question. I, you know, I, I wonder about that. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess my thought on that is, is that I think so. I mean, because when you start to live your life through your addiction, it's kind of who you become. And uh, that's who, how you think. It changes your attitudes. It's kind of your world view. So my short answer to that, just off the cuff, I think that's a, quite an interesting perspective. And I, I, I think, yes, uh, in my opinion. Uh, again, I don't know how I ought to back that up, but it just seems like it makes intuitive sense to me that living that life would create a culture of itself. All right, um, and the next question we have is, can you give an example of global thinking? Oh, I sure can. Um, in terms of the, the global thinking piece, um, for example, you know, what we, we're trying to do is look at, um, uh, for instance, I would say that I'm a global thinker. Uh, and so when I begin to evaluate evaluate something, I'm, I'm, I'm using critical thinking, but I'm I look at the question, I look at the answer, and then I go back and forth and continue to, to use a back and forth method of um, thinking globally, looking at it from different perspectives, uh, and um, you know, I'm making, you know, analyzing my assumptions. Uh, and so it's kind of like, to some people, I might look pretty indecisive uh, when it comes to that global thinking, but I'm, I'm not an indecisive person usually. It's that I have to think through something, and it takes me a while to get through that to look at the, all the perspectives. In relation to somebody who's more of a linear thinker, it's kind of that whole idea of A, B, C, D. You come up with multiple perspectives also from linear thinking, but you come up with them in different ways and in terms of more of a logical way. The global thinking is more of a question and answer process. All right. Um, so we've got, uh, looks like three more questions here, and I think we um, will just try to get through those, and that's probably all we'll have time for today. But the, um, the first is, um, this person said that, that they are a recovering addict. How much of their past should they reveal in counseling? Oh, thank you so much uh, for that question. I, I think that's something that you have to, as a clinician, determine. And I would love to have you get some clinical uh, supervision on that. Uh, how much? I think I think it, you, you have to determine how much is going to be helpful for the client. Uh, because if you're revealing um, a lot of yourself, uh, oftentimes it doesn't get the client to do the work. So what we want to do is be very careful about what we let people know. Myself, I've worked in addictions for 35 years. I don't have an addiction to drugs or alcohol. And so, you know, um, my revealing that sometimes is, is difficult because people say, well, you don't understand me then. So I think it's a, about per, a particular person's understanding. And again, I think it's a, a, a personal choice. But I would, if you're questioning that, I would say supervision on that, talk, over, talk it over. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, Try to um, 
change that in some way to see if you're more comfortable with um, what you share versus what you don't. Great. Um, so the next question is, as someone who is just making a beginning into the field of substance abuse counseling, where is the best place to start? I'm 55 years old and making a complete turn from my previous career into something I'm passionate about. Welcome to our world. Thank you so much for being so interested and passionate about working with people who suffer from addiction because we need people like you. That's number one. Uh, and I think where you should start really is um, there's a lot of wonderful models, people who are out there who are doing a good job. And even though you might be uh, somebody who is, um, in terms of age, uh, a new career for that, I think that if you start with an open mind uh, and uh, and think about what you can learn. Uh, one of the things that I would, um, I would very much uh, ask you to do is take a look at intentional interviewing, that, those books that I talked about from Alan Ivey a little earlier. And then the other thing I would say that would be very helpful that we're looking at in terms of a uh, evidence-based practice would be to look at motivational interviewing as a way to help you begin to get um, good solid skills uh, in um, uh, developing that client relationship. And I think, you know, I, I think your belief and your passion in this, it really helps, helps you. Thank you. All right, and the last question we'll address is, um, is it possible to provide treatment to restore people's original beliefs that have been changed through adaptive addict behavior, or is it okay for them to accept their new way of thinking? Well, um, I, I think I probably have to have some questions, ask some questions on that myself to the to the person who's asking that question. But the thing is, the what what you know is the adaptive thinking or the adaptive worldview now? Is that a functional? Is that a positive? Is that helping the person make change in positive areas, or is it a situation in which um, uh, it continues to have a negative impact on their life? And so I think that uh, I, I may say that you know thinking changes about things we adapt we think differently because of our experiences and I don't think there's anything wrong with that unless it's hurting us and hurting the people around us and I think that um, examining that it doesn't hurt to examine it and then come to a decision about do you want to keep that adaptive thinking or not great well thank you so much Kate for um, answering those questions and thank you to those of you who submitted them. Um, and again, I would like to thank Kate for sharing her knowledge with us today. Um, please watch for our email and handouts for this webinar. Attachments will include a CEU request form, a PowerPoint handout, and a Gipper consent form. We appreciate your decision to participate in our Gipper evaluation as completion of these forms allows us to show SAMHSA the number of people served by our webinar. To participate in the Gipper evaluation, return a signed consent form to our center by email or fax. We hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in this series, Professional Readiness, Attitudes and Values, presented by Bob Rarit on Wednesday, September 18. We hope you'll also be able to join us for our next webinar in our American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health webinar series on September 4, where Dolores Bigfoot will present Dancing Along the Fringe, Managing Ethical Dilemmas and Clinical Issues with Tribal Communities. Thank you for your time participating in the session today. We hope, you, we hope you've enjoyed the session and look forward to hearing your feedback.